would agree with what uh, Fred said. You know, we are taking a similar approach. We have four trials open and six trials coming, and, and you know, an a ALL and non Hodgkin's lymphoma, um, and, uh, and and now a couple of solid tumors at Sylvester. And we are, um, our, we have, uh, obviously, the, the role of the referring physicians, especially when it comes to solid tumors, you know, uh, physicians that we're not always, you know, uh, frequently interacting with, we are having a, a joint conference that happens every couple of weeks where we're discussing, uh, you know, the pipeline for these patients. In our service, those other physicians aren't directly attending on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, and that was really their choice. They wanted us to get called at 3 in the morning about the decision about whether to give tocilizumab or when to give steroids. But I think that, that I, I think what, when, when, when I've discussed with others, uh, you know, like Fred and, and, uh, and, uh, and obviously all, you know, all of you are, uh, you know, have centers where this is happening, um, you know, the models differ from place to place, but what is common is that there has to be an involvement of a cellular uh, apheresis uh, center and also a cell therapy laboratory and also high-level nursing and the kinds of sophisticated services that are typically found in transplant centers. It's not to say that it can't happen outside of a transplant center, but I think you have to have those resources. And often, whether the transplant physicians are doing it, you often see the transplant floors utilized because that's naturally part of what we do. I want, I want to ask you a question about this. I mean, the toxicity, there's a lot of strategies trying to control the toxicity because we don't want to give hydrosteroids, as we mentioned. And there's a, an approach we're using a suicide gene and to try to block the proliferation. So what do you think of this? So this is, I think, really exciting. Uh, and, and I think, really, the JCAR-017, I think, is the only one that has, uh, you know, a, a negative uh, regulator built in. The other uh, trials uh, that are happening right now don't have that. Um, now, one thing we don't know is, what degree of expansion is actually needed. We talked about this issue of persistence, and it seems intellectually necessary that persistence is needed. But we also know from the, you know, the, the NCI data that there are patients who have had durable responses with no persistence, right? So, so if really, you know, and it, may, and it may be that you need a big spike to actually reduce that high burden of disease. So it could be that if you abort it with a suicide vector that you're actually doing a, a disservice. It, it may, so I, I think that the concept is important. I think whether we give steroids or use a suicide vector that actually deletes the cells, um, you know, to prevent that toxicity from happening. I think that we have to think about that, but I think we're really early in understanding when we can successfully abort and how to balance the toxicities from, you know, the clinical effects. There's a, there's a, there's a little bit of a debate about the durability of the, those CAR T cells and if they need to be around for a long time, but I think everyone would agree and now and here at this table that you need to have an amplification in the beginning and in patients who have no toxicity, no fevers and no neurological limit manifestation, typically don't have a response. Another point I want to make in this therapy is immunotherapy, including checkpoint inhibitors, is the fact that for our audience, the restaging studies are different. When you look at the PET scan, very often the imaging is worse. And I think this is important to not be concerned because there's a huge inflammatory reaction. So we sometimes on checkpoint inhibitors, also on CAR T cells, see the first imaging that is worse. Yeah, and, and I think there's, a, there's another strategy besides that, that suicide switch. Um, if we could administer a drug alongside these uh, newer constructs of these CAR T cells that could kind of dial up or down the number of T cells or their activity, that would be uh, very useful rather than, than to terminate them completely. Um, we don't know about persistence. We don't know how important persistence is, and in fact, some of the newer trials are, are looking in more sensitive ways to find the CAR T cells within the peripheral blood. So, you know, T cells, uh, you don't need a lot of them, a lot of memory T cells to hang out in order to, to re-expand and, and, and cause an immune response. So, so it's still unclear whether uh, you need persistence that we're not detecting or whether we're completely curing um, these diseases like ALL or in, in lymphoma. Yeah, and studies of CMV immunotherapy, it seems like a different world, but, you know, Paul Moss in, in England showed that infusing just 40,000 CMV-specific T cells could control refractory viral infections that had failed multiple antiviral agents. So we know a small number of cells can do, you know, great good. Um, I think that, but to get to this issue of which strategies and when do we need to dial it up, when do we need to dial it down, these biomarker studies, both of uh, efficacy, is it the peak response, is it persistence, uh, and also of the toxicity, you know, can we predict, for example, by the basis of an inflammatory marker like CRP or, 
or something that's in the CSF, you know, can we then say, okay, this is the individual in which, you know, it, it, they hit a threshold in which now we have to shut it off, you know, whether it's by giving steroids or giving other agents or by using a suicide vector. I think we need that correlative data before we know how to tweak the response to maximize the good uh, effects without seeing the bad ones. I think it's also important to mention that uh, although early on there were uh, reports that, that steroids would, would sort of reduce the number of these cells, it's possible that if the peak number are quite high before steroids are given, that, that steroids won't affect the, the responses. So, so we don't fully know whether steroids sort of uh, affect the response rates in these treatments. Um, and we have to be safe. We have to safely administer it, these treatments. It's very early, but I think we should mention for our audience the data in myeloma, where immunotherapy has not been really exciting for so far, except maybe the combination of Chakrom and, and lenalidomide, as you mentioned before, Fred. The, um, the data in myeloma, there's a handful of patients who have achieved a remarkable response after failing um, all kind of therapies. So, so, so this there's is well, NY, I think, yeah, uh, I'm sorry, that was, that's the NYISO um, yeah. one specific, but I, I, at least I heard, uh, again, anecdotally that more recently that, that many of those patients are progressing. So again, I think that it's, it's early and we have to, we have to find out. Proof of concept, yeah. yeah. There are, there are